I'm Richard Earl. I'm Harley's youngest grandson. I just spent the last 19 years um, perhaps getting one of the greatest uh, business stories of the 20th century. Actually, I tell people it is the greatest business story of the 20th century because it's about the business team of players that created the number one company in the 20th century, which you all probably know, living here in metropolitan Detroit, was General Motors. And the best part of the story is that some of it fell through the cracks of time. What's so wonderful about this house and you're coming here is that some of the greatest leaders of the business world, not just the automotive world, the business world, walk through the halls of this house. I interviewed uh, the uh, chauffeur once and he told me about how he brought Alfred Sloan in the house, went into the library with Harley Earl, the doors drawn shut. And who knows what they were talking about. <laughs> but anyway, I have some photos I'd love to share with you. And it's actually pretty cool in here if you want to kind of come in. I'm only going to take about 10 minutes of your time. We are videotaping. If you could just stay about a foot in front of the table here, I'm so sorry. But yeah. please move in where you can hear him. Yeah, please, please. Thank come you. on, small audience or the audience please, is not so small. Right. It's, yep, it's, it's very right. intimate. Yeah. And we're next to one of Harley's greatest uh, milestones or creations. We're next to Ray's 59, beautifully restored 59 Corvette. And what I just want to start out with showing is a picture of my grandmother, because we all know how behind every great man, there's often an incredible woman. And that would be my grandmother, Sue Earl. And this, this is a story about gamblers, because this is literally a picture of my grandmother in action. If you guys come close, you'll see the picture. She's got four phones, four dogs, and a grandchild on the bed. And the funniest part is when she was older, she blew this, this picture up because she loved it so much and her grandchildren. She had eight of them. And this is a racing form, if you guys know anything about horse racing. Yeah, yeah, so she was like everything on Sea Biscuit. You know? So anyway, so before my grandmother and Harley moved to Detroit in 1927, Harley had an incredible, I call it a distinct competitive advantage over a lot of other people in the auto industry. His father was a 19th century coach builder and had created the largest automobile company on the West Coast. And Harley was from Hollywood and their company was down on Auto Row on Main and Pico, not far from the Peterson Museum, which is where I've spoken there too. And you know, I get to talk about just less than five miles from here is where it all began. These cars are really for today's Brad and Jolene, the highest, most successful celebrities of their day, bought Harley Earl Motoramic Masterpieces. They come into the auto body company. He would show them a model, a full-size model like you're seeing right here. And they would be blown away. And he had already done it in a two-dimensional rendering and like a Hollywood director going, let's build it. And he put it in a full-size clay model. And I'm going to get to this a little later in the presentation in a couple minutes. What was the body Well, you, you had, this was for Doheny. This was for, okay. So, so these were the celebrities. That's Fatty Arbuckle. He had three Harley Earl vehicles. I'm going to move quickly, though, because I don't want to get... This is a fantastic photo of three dynamic giants of the American automobile and the real brilliance behind the move uh, to get Detroit to become a design center. Detroit's dependency on design started right here. You've got a Ford tri-motor airplane. You've got Harley Earl. You've got the biggest celebrity in the mid-20s. Eddie Rickenbacker, World War I A, started his own car company. A legend. And then you've got maybe the biggest legend of them all, who is L.P. Fisher. And this guy, when, he, when, when, when the Fisher brothers walked into Alfred Sloan's office in the late 20s in Manhattan, 
his knees started to go like this slow because these guys ran Detroit. And the funny thing is, is that Sloan never once bought a house. Alfred P. Sloan, who wrote My Years with General Motors, never once had a home in Michigan. So these guys were down in the trenches, starting this new direction, which is getting everybody excited about Harley's dream. And General Motors basically built their dream on Harley, on you know Harley Earl's idea, which was he believed that a car not only could be, but should be a declaration of personal style. And this was his patron saint, Larry Fisher, L.P. Fisher. And I want to just tell you a quick anecdote about the family. And Harley and his wife Sue had his and her LaSalle, 27 LaSalles. And that's their firstborn child. He was born in uh, 25 in Hollywood, California. Not long after this photo was taken, there was a real tragedy in the family. Uh, little Billy, grand my grandmother took her son to the doctor's office because he had a, throat, so, a swollen throat. He was in there with the doctor in the examination room and my grandmother was in the waiting room and then the doctor was like, you know, stuck a crude brothoscope down little Billy's throat or a little rhythmoscope. You know, this is the 20s. Remember, this was pretty crude back then. Certain, certain things. Anyway, so he nicked the inside wall of little Billy's throat. The little boy started to bleed out, had a bleeding issue. And they're like, get Mrs. Earl. And the doctor's like, get Mrs. Earl in here. And the next thing you know, that little boy died in Sue Earl's arms. Her firstborn child died in her arms. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it affected the family for 90 years. It's about 90 years ago, uh, 92 years, or excuse me, 88 years ago right now, 87 years ago, this happened. But the thing is, I gotta tell you, before there were these, appearance and function are a parallel importance. If you go to CNN and read a story, it's called Steve Jobs and the King of Stylish Cars. It's all about the connection between what GM was doing, the greatest company of the 20th century, was built on the house of design. And, and that was the number one reason for car sales in the 20th century. And things are gonna go back. And Detroit, I want you all that are here tonight at Harley Earl's house when you leave, have this positive message. Let's do it again. Here, let's here. not wait, here. right? <laughs> yes, let's, let's, let's repeat performance. These guys, are the keys to turning around the American automobile industry because they were legendary at gaining market share, prestige, factory town jobs, and factory workers in America. They live for this. And they, the people, they, the ads of General Motors in the mid 20th century years, they said this. When a big business, this is wrapped around the big GM letters in like a dual, dual page ad in Life Magazine. When a big business prospers, the people prosper. And that's what was the heartbeat. It was all about a, an unwritten drumbeat was going on from the 20s to the late 50s, even into the 60s. And it was all about design and innovation leadership. And, and it spread. It wasn't just at GM. It was at Chrysler, Ford, and the other major car companies. So anyway, I wanted to tell you that about my grandmother because that was her firstborn child, and she had her next children when she moved to Michigan in 1927. And I'm going to fast forward here because the women, Harley and the women, if you want, I have copies of this page if you want to see it. But I'm going to read really quickly the words from this article. If any, This is a mid-50s article. If anyone has any lingering doubts about the economic, industrial, and general importance of women, he should have a few words with Harley J. Earl. If it weren't for women, he says everybody might still be driving plain black cars with high seats, small windshields, and maybe even hand-shifted gears. So it's kind of funny. There's, a, there's an incredible story. Harley saw women designers designing cars 10 years after he was gone. He wanted it to happen. Full-size you know, cars, not interiors. 
It was all about this. Women designers plot style revolution. When Harley put these women on his all-male teams, you could just watch the feathers fly. I mean, it was like it was like a snow globe. As you shake it up, what does it do? It gets more beautiful. And that's what he was like. Every day he went to work at GM building these cars like Jim's beautiful, beautiful Buick there. I mean, that car is a motor masterpiece, extraordinary, extraordinary vehicle. Anyway, so I, I have a quick question for you all. What do you see in the picture? What is that? It's a bus, right? It looks like a bus, right? Play it's model. not a bus. It's not a bus. Clay model. It's a clay model. It's a full-size clay model. Very good. It's pretty, it's a Trump boy. Basically, that's what Harley brought with him from Hollywood and the story. Maybe I'll do this another time in Harley's house in the future. I'd love to do it again and tell more stories like this one. And guess what? I'm going to do it again. Two of those babies are full-size clay models and, and, and not dr drivers. And they're just a complete trick of art. And this is how you build cars. Every car company in the world today uses the technology that came from Detroit and what Harley Earl. It's an all-American original. And this is something we should all be extremely proud of. Harley was like the Da Vinci of the 20th century, created a whole new form of individual expression. And it was all about art, engineering, and innovation. And we had the ad campaign, which I got started. The Da Vinci of Detroit. Bad timing. What year was that? That was 2002 to 2005. And um, some of the reasons, some people say the reason the campaign died such a miserable death is that when the people found out who Harley was and then they saw the cars that were on the road at the time that Buick was selling, they were like, we love Harley Earl, where's that guy today? And they just, there was this invidious comparison between the stuff that, the, the motoramic masterpieces that Harley did and the cars that were on the road today that kind of all look alike in many respects. So Harley's story is all about, let's get back to the heart and soul of automaking. So he invented clay modeling and graphic engineering as a profession now. It came out of GM in the mid, it came out of GM during World War II. And the paperwork is all there. The story has been living in the archives all along. It's a story that's been hiding in plain sight for 50 or 60 years now. So here we go. I just want to wrap it up. This is a beautiful picture where I am standing right now. Right now, with that fence that you see through the window. Was this building, was this little garage, was built after Harley sold the house in 59. But during the mid-50s, these national design treasures, the Y job and the LeSabre, were Harley's daily drivers. He was Mr. Automobile. He never wanted to be like Henry Ford. He didn't want to be a celebrity or a pop star. He didn't want to be famous. He wanted to be left alone to design. And these are the boys. Well, actually, that's my father on the right. There's no way my dad, I mean, my grandfather would let my dad drive that car. I'll tell you a funny thing <laughs> about my dad. You know, I, I tell him, I sit down and talk to him. He lives down in Florida, too. And I'm like, Dad, I'm you know, doing these speaking engagements. You know, Tell me some more fun anecdotes. And he told me an anecdote once. He goes, yeah, I'm like, Dad, come on, you were there. You're in the house, and thank, you were 16 years old. And, and he was born in 1930 and in Detroit. And I'm like, what was your favorite car? Tell me, what was your favorite car? And he looks me in the eye, and he goes, my favorite car was a car with a key in it. Anything with a key in it. Anything with a key Yeah, because he was like, he was a bit of a bad boy. I can tell you the other anecdote about how he was the bet that he couldn't take that Corvette up to 60 and get it back down to zero before driving it off the dock at the Grosse Point Yacht Club and how that story was covered up. But you could probably think what actually happened. You know, Hart, Jerry, he swam away to safety, but the car, you know, they had to come get him. 
Anyway, it's a funny anecdote. And then I want to just end on these uh, last couple of pictures and the direction where Harley was leaving the, the guys and the women at General Motors design staff. And, um, you know, he's like, if you guys ever, he, he said this, I, I got this when I interviewed one of the fellows uh, that worked for my grandfather. He's like, I was listening to one of your grandfather's retirement speeches, and he said it, and I, I, I gotta tell you this, he's like, Harley said in the dome at the tech center in 1958, the end of 1958, he's like, if you all, if you all ever lose this, what we started here, that'll be the time to rip out the urinals and piss on the floor, because it'll oh. all be over. Now, that's kind of a, like a whoa, Sorry. What, does he, what does he mean by that? I kind of think it's like, he wants America's auto industry to always remain strong, never to go away. Imagine what would happen 20, 30 years from now if your kids or your grandkids couldn't say, hey, I was from the, Mo I'm from the Motor City, and I'm proud of it, right? Imagine if that were to go away. This is America's business Serengeti. And why shouldn't we conserve and preserve this? Because this is the type of thing that just has a way of slipping through the cracks, much like this story did. And the reason I'm showing you this, this picture is I have another picture with, after the regime change. This is at the brand new tech center, and Harley just looked out the window, and he got the idea of where the next big trend in the American auto industry was. And he's like, I got it. And my uncle told me the story. He's like, all he did was look out his office window at the parking lot, and what did he see? He saw small cars, not just American small cars like the Corvette. If you guys come close, I'll, I'll leave this picture up there. You can come up and see it. It's not only the designers with their cars, the men, but it's the women. There's women and men, there's Volkswagens, there's Triumphs, there's MGs, there's Ferraris, there's lots of Corvettes, there's tons of Carmen Kias. Harley loved cars. And the thing is, he was dedicated, and, and talk about honor and pride. He, he's a patriarch. He, he should be knighted in the history of the American automobile industry. He created the number one reason for car sales before, during, and after World War II. Design, he put design on the business map. And after he died, the fortunes that be or the people that be, they, they were just like, yeah, that's the past. We, we're going to take this forward and do what we want. And it's all about, you know, sometimes, well, I won't get into that. I won't get into that. But anyway, I'm going to leave you a great Where's picture. Where's the picture facing? That's facing Mound Road, so it's facing west. It's right on top of the building. And and right now there's like, this lot supposedly bought all this property when he knew the tech center was going up very shrewd businessman. He was a very large shareholder. And the family is still around. I actually know of um, But what's exciting about this picture is um, it's, it's taken in 1957. So here's the last picture. Or actually, this is the second to last picture. I just want to show you this because this was heralded at the GM Tech Center in 1956. Life magazine called it the Versailles of Industry. And I just want to share this with you. The new Tech Center is the world's largest establishment devoted to research in the industrial arts and sciences. And which will undoubtedly quicken the pace of American commerce. This was all about keeping America strong. And America's leadership in the industrial arts and of the great human good it will achieve. And, and, and things like this went away, along with the Fisher Body Craftsman's Guild, which was the greatest uh, industrial uh, art appreciation and, and scholarship program that ran for 34 years. It was, it was as big as the Boy Scouts of America, and they used to give out you know, so much money in scholarship. Anyway, here's a great picture. Thank you for coming. Walk away tonight thinking about how Detroit is going to have a repeat performance and be happy that you live in one of the greatest cities in America. Amen. Thanks so much for coming.